Well, hi. Welcome, everybody. So, this is... Oh, hi. Can you get one of each of these handouts? So there should be uh, six altogether. So welcome to this course, whether you've signed up or whether you're just considering signing up or whether you just want to sit in the course, you're, you're very welcome. Um, this is Vision in Crisis, and in this course, we'll be looking at art. Well, if, if I put a dates on it, I'd say roughly from 1880 to 1914. But we will look at some art from after that time as well. I take different approaches in different courses that I teach, but in this course, I'm actually just going to focus on a small handful of artists to represent that period. In other courses, maybe I deal more broadly with different mo movements or trends, uh, or I may actually introduce you to a very large number of artists, uh, not really look at art, artists by artists. But in this case, that's the approach I will take. I try to have different approaches for different, um, different courses. So there's actually only a few artists we'll really look at, but we'll have enough time because of that to look at them in sufficient detail. So just to, to let you know, those artists will be Van Gogh, Gauguin, Cezanne, Picasso, and Matisse. And a little bit we'll also look at Braque, who with Picasso was really responsible for developing the visual language of Cubism. Um, that will be the main thing that I will be covering in my lectures, but as I will explain, uh, the course will start to diversify itself because of your contribution. Uh, in a sense, you'll be co-designing the course because in your tutorial presentations, you'll get to present on topics that interest you. And what, normally, what that normally means is that you'll introduce a large variety of other artists from this time period based on your own interests. So the course will start to complicate and diversify uh, in that way. So basically post-impressionism, if you look at it from the point of view of movements, we'll look at post-impressionism, we'll look at fauvism, we'll look at cubism. Uh, and what we'll then do at the very end of the course is to look a little bit at some things happening in Chinese art in the same time period or broadly connected phenomenon as a way to decenter a course that otherwise is very European centered. Um, you know, the way art history is often told is a European or a Western centered story. So I think it's important, especially if you're teaching uh, art history outside of uh, the West, uh, but actually wherever you're teaching art history, uh, to try and break down that centeredness. You can, you can pick up a book that says history of art, you know, and uh, it can include nothing but Western art, you know, and the rest is just sort of left out or at best just given one little chapter on, on each part of the world. So uh, we try to break down that focus a little bit or decenter it. Vision in Crisis, uh, the title of the course, is trying to describe a moment in art history when some pretty radical change is happening. Now, all the way through art history, there are changes, and some of them are quite major changes. This is certainly not the only one. But uh, the change that occurred roughly in the 1880s is a pretty major one. It's often taken as a moment where modern art as a whole starts. Uh, if you go to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, for instance, a museum that is explicitly about telling a story of modern art, you'll find that the displays start with artists like Van Gogh, Gauguin and Cézanne. So uh, it's a pretty major moment. But what kind of a moment is it? Now, some people would say, oh, it's just uh, a change of style. You know, artists change their style. We could understand the development that occurred in art at that time as just, uh, you know, artists wanting to paint in a different style for whatever reason. But uh, yeah, indeed, there were stylistic changes at that point in time. But uh, I would want to argue that maybe we have to look at things beyond mere 
stylistic or what you could call formal issues to understand that. This is not a, a controversial idea. Uh, a lot of other people would, would, would say the same thing. So I'm suggesting by this term vision in crisis that it's a, it, that changes what you might call an epistemic crisis, a crisis about our knowledge of the world, about art's ability to capture the world, to represent the world, that somehow a whole way of thinking that was a dominant way of thinking, a dominant paradigm behind the whole of the art of the Renaissance tradition starts to break down at that point in time. That's why so much modern art looks radically different from the art that preceded it. It's a time when people come to see that there is more than one way of representing the world in art. Um, it's a moment of a crisis of relativity, you could say. And part of that crisis of relativity is a discovery of other cultures and the fact that other cultures have their own ways, different ways of representing the world. And some of those ways may feel very attractive to, uh, to, to the artists who come across them. So it's partly a sense of cultural relativity coming in a really big way at that moment. So a kind of ending point of the Renaissance tradition and uh, larger forces at work to, to explain that. Now you could say maybe art isn't the only field that has a radical change during that time. You know, for example, if you looked at the field of physics, uh, the first years of the 20th century, the years of Einstein's theory of general uh, theory of relativity and, uh, and you know, specific, what is it, uh, specific relativity theory. You know, his general theory of relativity s starts working on that around 1907, I think, which is the same year that Picasso makes his sort of breakthrough work for cubism. Uh, so different fields of knowledge are having their breakthroughs. I'm not saying they're all sort of tied together. Uh, Picasso wasn't illustrating Einstein, and Einstein certainly wasn't being inspired by Picasso. Uh, sometimes there are uh, exchanges across different fields of knowledge, but not always. Uh, linguistics with Saussure, for instance, has a kind of breakthrough moment. Um, yeah, so in a sense, when we look at this moment of arts change, uh, a long moment of crisis from the 1880s into the early years of the 20th century, we're looking at a crisis of modernity that is part of a broader crisis of modernity. In, in its sense, and this is partly why it's valuable to look at, although it's always valuable to look at different moments of history and other cultures just for their own value, it's also of interest to look at this particular one because it's the beginning of a world in which we're still living today. You know, the, the relativity of belief systems is very much something that we're dealing with today. We're constantly confronted with different ways of understanding the world which may be quite uh, different from one another. You know, people talk about clashes of civilization, all sorts of ideas like that. Ideas are in conflict, not just at a, a trivial level, but at a fundamental level. That's part of what it is to be alive in the modern world. You, you have to decide a lot of things. It is, you can't just look it up uh, in your tradition and that that tradition will tell you what you do. We dress this way because we are whatever. No, nowadays you have to make every decision uh, for, your, for yourself. Uh, so I think it's really valuable to look at cultural figures, visual artists in this case, who first try to deal with these kind of issues that we live with or live within, you could say, even today. It's all relevant uh, to now. It's a breakdown where artists start to become more concerned. Obviously, everything I say now, I'll start to specify in more detail when we actually look at images. But just to give you a broad overview, it's a moment where art seems to lose its ability to transparently represent the world, to capture reality. Reality seems to sort of slip away uh, from art. Um, artists, as a result, start to think more about the language of art itself. Uh, 
Again, there's a parallel, say, with linguistics, where someone like Saussure starts thinking about the structure of language itself, not just what language can refer to in the world. So we see art is exploring the forms and colours of art as means in their own right, less concerned with just using art to represent the world itself. Uh, realism is no longer a trusty tool. Illusionism is no longer a trusty tool. So uh, I will refer from time to time to this notion of vision in crisis, but I want to make something clear, and that is that the title of the course is not something that we're going to be referring to at every moment of every lecture. I'm not kind of, uh, I'm actually going to be concerned most of the time, I hope you'll be concerned with most of the time, uh, the actual detail of uh, individual artists' work, you know. And I'm not actually trying to tell you how you should map this period. That's completely up to you. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, don't think that this idea must uh, come back a, a lot at every moment, you know. Um, just to give you an idea of um, two other courses I teach, because this is actually the first in a sequence of three courses taught over a two-year sequence, uh, the second of which will be taught in next semester, and the third will be taught in the first semester next year. Uh, each course can be taken purely on its own terms. You don't need to, to, to take the others. But actually, you happen to be sitting in the first of the three. So uh, you could get the sequence in, in order, should you so wish. So I'll just kind of explain what they are. The second of the three courses deals with uh, they, they're broadly chronologically, they deal with different time periods of modern art. So the second one deals with art, I would say, broadly between the two world wars, the First and Second World War, uh, and, and that course is called Modernity and it discon Its Discontents. And the, the course focus will be primarily on trying to understand art's relationship to society. Art is a critical tool, a tool for diagnosing what might be difficult or wrong or problematic with the modern world. And the third course is called Towards the Global, deals with art after 1945 to the present day, quite a large sweep of time, uh, and looks at how art uh, shifts, really, the story of modern art shifts to become a much more international story. The first shift, and the, maybe the major one we look at, will be the shift from uh, Europe, and especially Paris being the center of activity of modern art, to New York becoming that main center in the post-war years. Uh, but then we'll also look at how uh, we arrive at the situation where we are today, where art has become uh, a really international phenomenon. You know, Hong Kong itself is one of the top three art auction sites in the world. You know, that's a fairly recent phenomenon, but art you know, Chinese art is really big on the international uh, scene now. So that's the way the world has been changing. So that's a very brief overview. Uh, I'm going to have to do a lot of housekeeping here at the start to explain about what is required in, in the course. Um, and then in the second part of this morning, I will actually show you some images and we'll get down to looking at actual art. Uh, but I'm sorry, that's just the way it always is at the beginning of a course. Um, pretty much the most important things you need to know about the course are actually here in the About the Course handout. So a lot of what I'll say is said in maybe in slightly different wor words uh, in this handout. So be sure you read this and uh, at, at least I would read it today, but I would certainly read it before the ad drop period when you, you uh, lose the charts to uh, shift courses. Um, this course, uh, let's say a bit about assessment because that helps to explain what we're doing in this course um, and how it may be similar or different to other courses you've, you've taken. So the most important piece of uh, assessment, the most important piece of work that you will do, 
is to write a long essay. Uh, and that will represent 50% of your total grade. And there are two other assessments that uh, items that uh, each represent 20% of your total grade. Uh, the others are a presentation that you'll make during the tutorial sessions and uh, a visual test which will take place towards the very end of the course. And then there's also 10% which is attendance and participation. Now, um, I know everyone comes from different backgrounds, different departments, different universities even, so you'll be used to different practice practices but you know in some courses you may have uh, topics assigned to you either a specific topic or a list of topics but certainly uh, in this particular course you will have to devise your own essay topic from zero um, the idea is that then uh, the center of your study is you and your own interests and you have the chance to develop your own interests in the context of this course uh, of course, it's actually quite difficult to, to, to start from zero and develop your own um, uh, theme of research and writing. But that's the point, you know, actually learning how to start from no fixed beginning is a really valuable skill, actually. And uh, the more years I spend teaching, the more I'm becoming concerned with trying to help you develop the skills which are really going to be valuable to you in life. You know, in the Hong Kong education system, maybe the Chinese education system as a whole, a lot of emphasis is placed on memory work and I think I, I'm in this course really downplaying the role of memory. Now, that's actually quite important, but say uh, even compared to how things were 20 years ago, you know, there's so much information now because of the internet that is very, just a click or two away, you can really uh, get back, uh, get, get or get back uh, all sorts of information that you, that you need of a, of a purely factual or empirical uh, basis if you've learned how to gather that information in the first place and if you have some understanding of why you might want that information in the first place. Uh, so, you know, yeah, I'm hoping during the course of this course you will learn a lot of things about uh, the art of this period, but I can also guarantee that um, a lot of the things you learn 10 years from now you maybe will, will not remember, you know, that's just the, the way th things are. Um, but hopefully what will stay with you is learning how to learn, you know, this is actually what will stay with you from your whole university studies. Uh, you, you, will have, you, you, you will learn enough facts, hopefully, to create your own mental map. Each of you will have your own map. I will be assigning you what the map of art history is. You will each be making your, your own. Um, but um, the most important skills you're going to get in your university education are the transferable skills of learning to think critically, learning to... Um, deal with fuzzy situations where nobody's telling you what the question is, um, trying to research a topic that you have defined and express that in words, your own words, uh, express that in written words, in the case of the long essay, express it in spoken words, which is the skill which will be developed it with your tutorial presentation. So these are very basic, obvious skills, but we'll, we'll place perhaps a little bit more emphasis on them um, than on uh, than maybe in some other other courses. Uh, you could say this is based on a philosophy of education that's more student-centered. Your education is about you and what what you want to get from this course. Uh, so. Um, you're co-designing the content of the course by choosing your essay topic and I will respond to that by trying to give you uh, help and advice as much as I can. I think the, the role of a teacher is actually not that big. I mean, I, I wouldn't subscribe to what you might call the bucket theory of education, which is actually rather 
um, you know, dismissive of, of you as students. You know, the idea that the teacher comes in with a big bucket of knowledge, you know, and you have your small but empty buckets and I will sort of give each of you a little bit of what's in my bucket so that then you can care not to spill it, you know. Uh, it, that's, that's a really patronising notion of education and once you put it in a, a metaphor like that then it becomes obvious. Um, education is something you are doing to yourself for your own purposes and the teachers they're just like maybe a catalyst at best or maybe just a sort of cheerleader you know uh, it could be as little as that um, so the lectures actually are not the course that's a common sort of error that's sometimes made you know the lectures are not the course the lectures are just one possible source of information maybe not even the most important sort of information I would say the most important things you do on this course and arguably any course is the reading of books and articles, um, the thinking about those readings, the looking at works of art or sadly in most cases images of works of art and the thinking about what you see, thinking and feeling. And then the writing and talking you do about that. That's the most important thing. The lectures are relatively important. You know? Hopefully at some point in the lectures I will say things that no other art historian has ever said. If I'm lucky I might do that once or twice. But for the most part my lectures will inevitably be on topics that I haven't done personal research on. I'm not at the f growing edge of that field. So you'll get far more information about those artists from scholars who spent a whole life just looking at Cezanne or whoever it turns out to be. You know, they've looked at every image in great, great detail. They've looked at every document that survives. They spend more time than any of us really could to investigate that topic. And sure, if you read their bo book, then you will know you, you're, you're engaging with a source that is rich, richest seam of uh, knowledge than that I will be providing it. So that's a reason why um, what you're, you're going to get from your reading is, is really important. So it, it's um, a kind of an undirective, student-centered approach to teaching. And the major thing will be your... Hi, can you take one of each of these handouts? There should be six. I've already started talking, uh, but the course about the course handout is the most important one that will help you catch up. And by the way, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to record each lecture as a sound file. So if you're ever sick or otherwise unavoidably miss a lecture, uh, then there should be a sound file available from the Fine Arts Resources Room which is on the 10th floor, right next door to the Fine Arts Department office. And I will also put PowerPoints of my uh, lectures uh, in that resources room that you can view. I'm not going to use the Moodle site that some of you will be familiar with. I'll, I'll have other ways of communicating with you. Um, but um, I, I don't really, I haven't subscribed to that as a, a a system. So uh, your long essay, it's the most important thing you do and it's actually the the last bit of assessment you'll have to submit. You'll submit it around the end of the uh, of, of the teaching semester, maybe a little bit after. But because it's the most important I suggest you start thinking about it now because it's the biggest, the biggest task. Uh, time management is a really important skill to learn. It's something we're, you know, everyone is still learning in a way, you know, I'm still learning it. But to the extent that you can learn to manage your time, you'll have conquered a big obstacle towards achieving things. And generally speaking, most students find that they are a lot less busy in the first half of their semester than the second half. You know, you, in the second half, you'll find you're getting deadlines for other essays conflicting. Um, 
I, I won't be giving you any extension because you've got another essay that also has to finish at the same time because yeah everyone's in that situation the whole class will be in that situation so that's just part of the parameters you work with so start working now um, if you if you don't do good time management I would say that's probably the main reason why a student doesn't get as good a grade as they are capable of getting because they became rushed in their work process and maybe they lost the, the normal steps you should work through in writing an essay. You need time to think, you know. What, what I would do, I would start from your own interest, you know. I, mean, I think uh, as long as you connect your study to who you are and what really interests you, what turns you on, then you're going to do well. You know, you're using your study to change yourself. That's the main thing you do as, a, as an undergraduate student. You know, education is a subversive activity because you are questioning everything. You're changing yourself and therefore you, when you change yourself, you will go out there and change the world as well. Uh, so start from your own interests and concerns what art you already like. But of course, what you'll want to do is to expose yourself to art uh, of this time period, 1880 to 1914, or broadly during that time period, could be a bit before, a bit after, and see what interests you. I mean, your first step could even be, you, you don't even read about it, you just look at some images. Often, actually, that's a good approach. Don't always have your approach to art filtered through other people's written words about it or my spoken words about it. Try to try to, to look yourself and see what questions come up. Look at an image for 10 minutes. Nowadays we, uh, we live in a world of short attention spans but um, just spend 10 minutes looking at an, an image and see what, what comes up and uh, things may come up that, that uh, you hadn't thought about. So start with, start with looking and thinking, feeling about art. Then I would say what you do is read some more general books about the art of this period to give yourself a broad overview. You're not worried about going in depth. There's not going to be an exam where you have to have in-depth knowledge about this whole period anyway what you're doing is just to get a, a broad overview to make sure that you're aware what are the different things going on in the class. As I told you, we're just looking at a few artists, so be sure that you're not just going to read about those artists, you're going to read about other artists from this time period as well um, till you come across something that intrigues you. So the first phase is more a kind of you know, it's, you're skating across the surface a little bit. You're aware that you're not going into depth about things. But you may, wow, you suddenly, in your skating around, you suddenly see something that really overwhelms you. And wow, I have to stop and think about this. I have to look at this in more detail. Then you start to dig down deeper. You go into the, you start to find out, well, first of all, you're doing a bibliographic search. What has been written and said already about this artist, this theme, this artwork that interests me. And let me see what I can find out. So you, you, you define what is already the discourse about this topic, what is the best writing that's been written about this topic, and then you go down into depth. And in most cases you'll find there's more written than you're going to be able to read actually in the, in, in a, the time available to you. But, uh, so how do you deal with that? Well, you try and read the best stuff. So you don't, you don't uh, mostly you're not relying on websites because uh, that often provides trivial knowledge. Occasionally, uh, museum websites uh, will have very good information, but even there, it's often for the general public. It's not really for, for students. So use your time carefully. Uh, I would go to academic books and articles and I would go to the most recent academic books and art articles. How do you know? I mean art is different from some fields like I don't know like physics say. Uh, most books 
published in certain academic fields are read only by the people studying that field. But art is something that everyone might love. So a lot of art books are written for the general public, what you might call coffee table books. And some of those books are in our library, you know, maybe, you know, Hong Kong, because they were printed in Hong Kong and any book printed in Hong Kong, you have to send a copy to Hong Kong U Library. It's the law, you know. So all kinds of books are there. It doesn't mean that we, we think they're good books or something like that. Or uh, sometimes we will order those books because they have really good illustrations or something like that, uh, not because of the text. So how do you tell a good book? You, 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 you can say a book that's published by a university press is likely to be a good book. That book would have been refereed. You know, other academics would have read it uh, before it was accepted for publication. Um, you know, it's sort of like peer review in science in any area, it's the same thing. Or you can get books by any recognized art publisher. Over time, you get a sense of what they are. Thames and Hudson, Fiden, Reaction, Ashgate, there are, there are a whole bunch. After, after a while, you get a sense of how to evaluate the look of things. The other thing is to go for the most recent book. If there are five books about your artist, start with the most recent one, because whoever wrote that book has read the earlier ones, definitely, uh, and therefore has absorbed what those earlier authors have to say. It's no use reading a, a 40 year old book, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, what well, it may be a very good book and it's worth reading, but you should know that scholarship will have moved on after that time. For articles, of course, al almost any article will be of academic uh, respectability, so you're okay there. And nowadays, a lot of academic articles are available online in full text format through JSTOR, you know, this resource. But the thing about JSTOR is that it doesn't show you very recent, uh, recently published articles. There's a kind of time delay before things get in there for you know, financial reasons of the publishers. Uh, so you need to use resources like the Art Index, bibliographic guides that can alert you to information about your particular theme, where it exists. Uh, you might find with academic articles, you may not find something exactly what you need, but if you do find something, it could be really, really useful. So you need to, to, to check for that. So finding what literature is available, having respect for the scholars who've already given so much of their time to thinking about these topics. What you're after to begin with is not uh, you don't need to know what you're, what you're going to say in your essay, obviously. All you need to have at the beginning is a sense of what question interests me. Broadly, what question or group of questions interests me. You don't need to know what the answer is. In fact, uh, you should be a bit wary of having too strong opinions about something at an early stage. The process is to try and test your assumptions or existing assumptions. Um, you want to have research questions. The research question could be very, very simple. Um, you, you, don't want, um, you don't want to build too many assumptions into your question. Otherwise, it could just collapse on you. Um, you know, like if my question to you was, when did you last beat up your kid's system? You know, I would investigate this issue and find out. Well, but as I get further into the investigation, I might find, oh, well, she doesn't have a kid system, or oh, she doesn't beat up her kid system. Oh, my whole project is collapsed, you know. So obviously that's an extreme, absurd example, but you'll be surprised how easy it is to build assumptions into your research question. You want an open-ended question, you know. If it was an interesting question to investigate whether you beat up your kid sister for some reason, then we will just find out, does she or doesn't she? And if we find out yes, yes, okay. If we find out no, oh, that's okay. You know, we've, we've got an answer, you know, we've, it's all worked out. So framing is important. And what I'd like you to do is to come back to me with some idea of what your topic will be. Uh, at the very latest, by the reading week, that's the middle of the semester. If you don't have your 
basic topic defined by then, and you've done some ground reading, I would say you're behind schedule. Uh, if you come back to me next week with your topic already defined, I would say, well, either you're incredibly hard working or maybe you've jumped too quickly to decide your topic. And sometimes you've got to play around with it and investigate a bit further. Maybe you haven't investigated, you'll find there's a more interesting topic uh, to come up. The topic is not necessarily one artist or one painting, anything like that. It could be. Um, and I'd like to reiterate, don't assume you have to write about the, uh, the artists that we are talking about in class. Really, in some ways, it's better that you don't. Or it's slightly more difficult if you do. They, they are very interesting artists that, and very important artists. That's why I've chosen to focus on them. But um, somehow, you know, the, the bar is higher let me put it that way, if you're writing about those artists because we already will have had a lot of information come out about them. I don't want to have essays that just go back over the same ground we've covered in lectures. So use it to investigate your own personal interest. The reason I'm asking you to, to get approval for your topic from me it's not because I'm going to really police you and say, no, you're not allowed to work on that artist. Because you know, it's, it's more about, uh, I'm worried in some cases someone may choose a topic that's too broad. You know, there's just too much work to do. You're never going to be able to do it properly. Or, or alternatively, too narrow. Yeah, you're just, it's maybe a very interesting question. In, in history, there are lots of interesting questions. But some of them you just can't answer you know like it would be very interesting to know what napoleon was thinking on the eve of the battle of waterloo but sorry how are you going to find that out you know we can't he's not here and we can't even if he was here we can't sort of open his mind and find out what he was thinking then you know some historical questions are, are just unanswerable so partly that comes down to what resources are available you know so the literature search is quite important if there's enough material in the secondary literature, the literature written by scholars, that's because there's enough material in the primary literature. Of course, we are a bit better off than the historians of, uh, of conflict. You know, someone studying the Battle of Waterloo, they can't rerun the Battle of Waterloo to inspect it. But with our history, in most cases, th those images do survive now. We can inspect them in the present tense here and now so we you know that's the most valuable resource that we have is here still available to us that's one thing that's a little bit different between art history and other kinds of historical most other kinds of historical work so potentially you can come up with something new because you are right there in front of the same thing itself you know just as even a kid who was watching the battle of waterloo may notice something that uh, no one else has seen you know So first, your, your interest is your research question. You don't need to know how my essay will be structured. You wait till you found out what you found. Then you start thinking about that question. How can I, what's the best way to structure this? You know, you're, you're looking at your notes and thinking, well, how will I put this together? So you don't need to know the title of your essay. Uh, you need to know your research question, if you like. And any questions about that? In the course handout, there's a little bit more about essay. There's also essay writing, and also there is an essay writing handout, a separate handout, which has got a few general hints about essay writing. That's not something you need to worry about today, but you know, when you first start to come thinking about uh, your, your essay, maybe read through that at that point. Does, does anyone feel worried that uh, I haven't, you know, explained properly what the, the, essay question, the essay issue is? You can always come to talk to me after the class about that or about any issue. Um, that's the best time to get me. I'm, I'm happy to stay as long as it takes to talk with whoever needs to talk with me at that point. Of course, you can also email me and I'll try to get back as soon as I can. Um, but Sometimes uh, 
face to face is a bit better because uh, we can move forward more quickly sometimes. You know, you could spend a, a long time writing a whole page email and then my reply might be, well, no, but that's, you misunderstood. It's not that at all. It, you, know, <laughs> you know, you could end up wasted a bit, wasting a bit of your time that way. Uh, you could also ring me in my office if I'm there. So the second um, assessment is the, the tutorial presentation. Now, in a lot of our department's courses, the format of presentations is they take place every few weeks, and you have a set reading, and then you're responsible for doing that reading, then discussing that reading in the class. And that is very valuable, but that's not what is being done in this course. In this course, uh, the tutorials will all be bunched together. Once they start, they'll go on every week, except for reading week or for the uh, holiday, uh, public holidays, you know. Uh, and, and they will be used for you making your personal presentations. Uh, presentation time will be about 10 minutes. I'll, I'll tell you the exact length of time once I know exactly who is signed up for this course, which I won't know for for two weeks till the end of the ad drop period. But since it's the first thing that you will do, I think you really need to start pretty much straight away thinking about your topic. It's going to be a much narrower topic than your essay topic. I would say probably you're going to talk about one image or one very tightly defined topic because 10 minutes will go by really quickly. You won't have time to, to, to say a lot. So. Again, this is a really important skill. You know, learning how to express yourself in writing is a very valuable life skill. It's really going to get you on the thread of your own creativity. It helps you develop your own interiority. Uh, same thing with um, speaking skills. Obviously, this is in all kinds of jobs that you may end up in, being able to present on a topic concisely and persuasively. That's a really valuable skill. So. Don't worry too much about background, you know, just launch into the main issue. Uh, if you have background information, you may want to present that to people on a handout. Maybe some detail about the artist's biography or something. Make a handout and get the department office to copy it for you and give it out to the people in your tutorial group. But s start straight into the main point. And uh, although it won't be as structured as an essay, an essay you can come back and do draft after draft and really refine it, you know, think about it as a, uh, a sort of work of art in a way. Uh, but for spoken presentations are bound to be much more uh, informal, more chatty. I don't want you to read from a script. That's not the skill. There are situations where you might read from a script. I'm not reading from a script in my lectures, but. Sometimes I may give a formal lectures where I, uh, lecture where I do read from a script because that's the best way to get information across. That's okay, but in this project, I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you to speak from notes uh, more informally. But even though it's uh, more informal than a written presentation, I hope you'll have some kind of a conclusion. Again, you know, let me know if you have any problems about that. I, I would say you, most, mostly what people do is they bring a PowerPoint along with them uh, to present uh, in, the, in, in the tutorials. I would say you probably don't need more than about eight images, eight slides in your, in your PowerPoint. You know, if you think of a, a, a presentation that's 10 minutes long, um, if you have an image that's on the screen just for one minute, that's not much time for your audience to to get accustomed to it and for you to analyze it. So eight images, that means eight, eight images for one minute plus you, you spent one minute on the introduction, one minute on the conclusion. So eight is already a lot of images to, to use, a lot of slides to use in a presentation. So you could actually make a really good presentation with only one image or two, two images. Uh, don't Less is more. Don't try to do too much within the space of your presentation. It's a, you know, you, you're learning as you go, but, you know, this is a really, really valuable skill to, to, to develop.
I won't say much about the third assessment, that is the class test. Um, I've said memory skills are not that important, but actually there will be some memory skills involved in that test. Uh, that will be basically based on the content of the lecture. So it's my way of ensuring that you do turn up for lectures, so you have some reason to turn up for lectures. Uh, because to do your tutorial presentation and your long essay, actually you could do very good ones without being in, in the lectures if you have other source of information. Um, many courses that I took um, when I was a student, there were no lectures, you know, uh, and that wasn't a problem. Hi, could you take um, one of each? There are six. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, but even with the, the class test, it's not just a memory test. Some people will try and treat it that way. I would say all the way through the course and all the way through your study of art history, one thing you're trying to do is you're trying to learn your own personal method for analysing works of art. You're training your eye. So that test will primarily be about that. What is my approach to understanding and analysing works of art? You know, Do I have a particular emphasis? Do I emphasise talking about style or talking about content, subject matter? Uh, how important is it to understand the context within which a work was made, etc., etc., lots of different things. So again, uh, there's no template that I'm going to put give to you. I'm not going to take you through a sort of boot camp of how you have to analyse works of art. You know, it's each of you, I want you to develop your own individual perspectives you know I want you to be more who you already are more deeply who you already are through engaging with this process um, one important thing is um, this course has three lecture slots there's a Friday lecture slot now um, we won't meet this Friday we won't meet next Friday we won't meet on Fridays until I tell you that we're going to meet on Fridays Actually, the Friday slot will be used for the class test, any makeup tests, any makeup classes. Uh, it will also be one of the tutorial slots. Uh, so um, while we're having tutorials, we also won't meet. You know? um, keep, it, keep it free, but you, you won't need to meet until I tell you to, to meet. So overall, there won't be more meetings than there are in other classes, I'll put it that way. So I, I really need from you um, the information about your tutorial availability. I've, I've given three slots. Now, one, as I just said, is the slot for your uh, on Fridays during the, the timetable lecture class. Now, I'm assuming everyone can make that slot, but I need to know your availability for all of the three slots. I'm hoping I can fit you within those three slots. If the number of students in the class remains what it is today, then probably we can get by with three groups. But because there's this two-week ad drop period, it's very difficult. It's hard to know uh, who, who's going to be in the class. But I need you to tell me your availability. That gives me an idea, am I going to be able to do it? If there's any changes come up in your availability, then... Uh, please let me know by email or uh, at the very latest by next week in the class. I won't be able to tell you your tutorial groups until after the ad drop period because I won't know who's in the class till after the ad drop period. That's one of the problems with having an ad drop period, a course selection period of two weeks. But can you fill this in? We'll have a little break now and then after the break, I'll actually talk about art directly. But can you, during the break, fill in uh, your availabilities? And then please uh, let me have it before you, either now or, or after you, before you leave the room today.